musically simple, lyrically simple. It's the, it's the cheesiest kind of fun that we'll, we'll ever hear. You're like, yay! We hear the song and we go, hooray! And we want to dance. Um, and it is the, um, the song Kung Fu Fighting by Carl Douglas, which was a massive international hit in 1974. And it, it still hasn't gone away. It hasn't gone away. It's, it's just there. And everyone always laughs at it. So I think that it's, it's a really, really valuable thing to, to analyse. I really like looking at things that people think are trivial and inconsequential. Um, and and I, was, I was thinking about this yesterday. And one of the reasons is, I remember, so Jacques Derrida, right? Who, Jacques Derrida was... Uh, a post-structuralist philosopher. I'll tell you more about him later and next week. And he died. And they had a conference immediately after Derrida died. What are we going to do next? And there was this guy, this philosopher, talking about Derrida's work and saying Jacques Derrida argued that every text above a certain level of complexity, blah, 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 blah. And he kept saying this. Every text above a certain level of complexity. And I was thinking... When did Derrida ever talk about the need for text to be beyond a certain level of complexity? He never, ever said that. So since then, I've always chosen texts that are supposedly simplistic and simple, because if we're only looking for these texts that are above a certain level of complexity, then we're going to look at modernist literature and avant-garde art, and we're going to be reactivating the high-low boundary, like the, the high culture, which is the intellectual stuff, and there's low culture, which isn't. And I think that a song like Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting is an important intellectual document, an important, complex, sophisticated, consequential cultural document. And I want to explore it. We're going to look at it. We're going to take it seriously. Um, and it's going to be a kind of an example of the analysis of the representation of a song. So first, I'll play you the song. This was... I'm going to play it two versions. I'll play the full version the first time. I might not play the full version of all of the different iterations of the song, that some of which I've shared here. So, 1974, right? Carl Douglas appears on Top of the Pops. Top of the Pops was just about the only popular music television show that was running. It was used to be on a Thursday night. Uh, I think just after Tomorrow's World, right? It was a big deal. It was massive. And, um, and subsequent... The thing with Top of the Pops was... Um, when a band or an artist couldn't appear on Top of the Pops in Britain, because it was the only outlet to, be, to, to get visibility and to get people buying your records, they started to... They would make a music video, which they didn't call a music video at the time, but we would call it a music video now. So Britain was one of the first countries where the music industry, the popular music industry, started to produce music videos. And this is a slight digression, but it's relevant. Because when MTV was formed and founded and, and, and first broadcast in 1981 in the United States, they were really hungry for music videos. And American bands and bands from the rest of the world weren't producing music videos because they didn't have Top of the Pops, which needed them. If they were on tour and they couldn't appear on Top of the Pops, they had to give them something, a film. So what happened was, really interestingly, is that a load of British bands who were relatively obscure, like, you know, they'd sold a few thousand records in Britain, their videos are played on MTV in 1981 and through the early 80s. And all of a sudden, they become like these massive, mega successful bands in America. So you had bands like Flock of Seagulls and, and, and all these really sort of weird early 80s bands that went from nothing and they were catapulted into massive um, stardom and riches thanks to music videos. Um, so it just goes to show you the power of, of, of media in that respect. But So this is before music videos. So the first version was his first performance on Top of the Pops. Look at how bored the audience looked. They don't know this guy. They don't give a monkeys about him. And then there's an uh, original music video which has been constructed from, edited together, bits and pieces of Top of the Pops performances, by which time the audience are much more interested. So we'll just look at the first version first. First version on Top of the Pops. Everybody was 
I love the audience in that. Look at that, how much they're digging it. So, the, the, the audience can't even bring themselves to look at him. Um, right, who hasn't heard that song before? You've heard it before then, of course. Who has, I asked online, um, and it's not that well known um, in certain... Asian countries, that, but I mean, it wasn't a very like scientific study. But I've asked around, like, and like anyone, everyone in Europe knows it. Every one of your parents' generation, um, uh, and and again, and young, everyone knows it. It was released. It was a massive single. Some countries produced their own native language version of it. Um, I think Sweden and, and Finland wanted their own. Uh, there was also, I think, a German release, but the the English language release got to number one. It was number one in Australia number one in North America. So, um, what's it about? What are we getting from that song? Has anyone got an interpretation of the lyrics? Anyone prepare? I've, I know I've left, let you off the hook until now. What is that song about? <laughs> it's about Kung Fu. <laughs> it is. It, it, it is about Kung Fu. It's about Kung Fu fighting. The answer is in the title, really, isn't it? So everybody was Kung Fu fighting. Um, do we have any advance on who this everybody is? Everybody in the world? Everybody in Chinatown? Everybody in Chinatown? Well, we'll look at the lyrics in more detail later, Brock. Um, so, we've looked at it, we've listened to the lyrics, we still haven't got the li- we haven't... Actually, it's quite hard to come out with a completely coherent interpretation of the lyrics. I was surprised that it took me about two days. Well, you know that thing where you kind of spend a long time looking at things going, what is this about? And then the next day you wake up and go, oh, that's what it's about. It was like I didn't spend two whole days like <laughs> meditating under a tree on, on the kind of puzzle of, of what the lyrics might mean. But so we've got the visuals of it. We've, so we can see Carl. We know what Carl looks like. We know what Carl's wearing. We've heard the music, we've heard the lyrics, but we haven't fully got an interpretation yet. Let's have a look at the official music video, which, which wasn't the original music video, but nonetheless. Everybody was going to fight it. Those 
All right, okay, 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 okay. Um, so that's the, that's the music video, right? It wasn't the music video as such, that was just cobbled together afterwards from performances on Top of the Pops. But by this stage, uh, people are into Carl Douglas now, we're into him. The audience are actually dancing. Uh, the, the company, the record company, whoever have, have given him some dancers there to, to do their kung fu moves, right? Oh, what genre of music is this? Is it rock, pop, hip hop, R and B, jazz, disco? Did I hear someone say disco? Yes, it's disco. You're very good today. Well done. It's disco. It's disco music, right? Doesn't matter. But it, it actually, it, it kind of, it does matter actually. Shall I tell you for why? I'll tell you for why. So in the history of disco music, disco started out as a radical underground, bit sexy, bit kind of deviant sexualities, New York sort of thing. And then we now all think, well, history of disco, and we go, got a few people, and we go Donna Summer, and we go... Da, 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 da. Carl Douglas, people. It was Carl Douglas, it was this song that mainstreamed and introduced disco to the whole world. Disco before this song was an edgy, scary thing. It was like punk rock would be, or acid house, or, or any of these other things that were scary. Grime. It was like grime. It was the grime of the time, right? It was. It was scary. It was about racial intermingling in New York, and gay people, and lesbians, and bisexual people, and people having sex, and taking drugs. That's what it was about. It was scary stuff, right? Carl Douglas mainstreamed it, brought it into the mainstream of popular cultural consciousness. The song was released in 1974. This is the year after the Bruce Lee film Enter the Dragon, which was the mainstreaming of uh, martial arts. It was the first film, second film really, but first film that actually used the term martial arts. It was, this was a massive global hit. So you've got Enter the Dragon, this new craze, the Kung Fu craze, 1973 is when, it, when people identified the Kung Fu craze. And it was all about Bruce Lee, one or two other people. And then this song comes along riding on the crest, right, like the Silver Surfer, of the wave of the Kung Fu craze and this new radical new sound called disco. Radical new sound. And the lyrics, lyrically, it's talking about this thing that everyone's into. Everybody's into Kung Fu fighting. And this phrase is stuck. This phrase, everybody was Kung Fu fighting, has not gone away. Academics have written books called Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting. And one thing that I've noticed about those books is they never actually talk about this song. They never do. Any, art, any academic article you read, Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting, as the title, they never mention it. Ever. So I'm redressing this balance. Anyway... We've got Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting. Why won't it go away? We love this song. We still love it. You know it. Younger people than you know it. Older people than me know this song. It won't go away because it keeps being what we would, might call remediated, reiterated, reused, retooled, represented. So, for example, if we go to a 1990s film, this is Rush Hour. <laughs> So the Rush Hour films, um, this is um, Jackie Chan meets, uh, I want to say Chris Tucker, is that right? I, I'm terrible with actors' names. Anyway, the point of the Rush Hour films is you get, you've got the Jackie Chan kung fu character teaming up with the hip black character, right? And there's a historical reason for this pairing, and the historical reason for this pairing is that in the history of the dissemination of martial arts films, they were first of all imported from Hong Kong in particular, and then and Japan also. And they were played in the poorest cinemas, in the poorest areas, the ones that couldn't afford to show the big budget, uh, big budget films in America. And the audiences for the first martial arts films, the Kung Fu films, the, the Japanese samurai films, um, were poor Hispanics, 
and blacks, right? And the connection was made very early on between these different, these different ethnic demographics. And the film industry has always known this. The film industry was the first one to catch on. Hmm. So if you look at a film like Enter the Dragon, which I know most of you haven't seen, it's a James Bond film, and they wanted it to star Bruce Lee. But Bruce Lee is Asian, Asian-American, but Asian, right? And so they, had to, they actually split the key role three ways. In End of the Dragon, you have a white guy who's playing the kind of, uh, kind of Bruce Lee sort of suave figure. And they have a black guy who's playing the cool, hip American character guy. And they have Bruce Lee, who they really wanted it to, but they couldn't take the risk. So they, they didn't want to alienate the white viewership. So they had to have a white actor in there because the film industry was scared. They recognised the popularity of these texts among different ethnic uh, markets would be the word. So this is something that's constantly been reiterated throughout, throughout cinema, the connection between uh, Asian martial arts and black ethnicity in America in particular. But it's not just that, it's also mainstream. So this is a kind of rush hour. The Rush Hour series is a comedy um, series of films mixture of action and comedy that showcases the kind of the, the, what they call the black connection. Jackie Chan and the black connection is the, is the best article written by Gina Marchetti about it. But we also have things like this. Let's have a look at this. Do you feel hot in If you look at the, just the visuals of this, think about this module. Is there one word that describes what we're looking at? <laughs> Orientalism. Yeah, are we there? You remember Orientalism? Orientalism, what is it? It's the kind of simplification of the other, the stereotyping. It's not hostile. It's not a hostile sim simplifying or stereotyping. But nonetheless, it's the reduction of the other, the other group, the other culture, the other thing, to a simplistic stereotype. So the question is, is this Orientalism? <laughs> Or is it not? Oh. Okay, I'm going to go with yes it is. I'm going to say that, I'm going to suggest that that is Orientalist. I mean, we're going to ask that question again about the original song, the song itself and the first artist. Is it Orientalist? Is it therefore racist? And is it, and this is a really good one, is it cultural appropriation? Cultural appropriation. Um, cultural appropriation being the, typically, it's st stereotypically, I guess, cultural appropriation is when you get in North America some kind of frat boy wearing some, like, Native American headdress or something for a party. Or you get... What's Kyle Jenner's sister called again? <laughs> or oh, so one of these people putting cornrows in their hair and people go, ah, ah, but that's not from your culture. That's cultural appropriation. You're a racist and we should tweet nasty things about you forever, right? Forever. So that's cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is a, is a massive deal in, in North America in particular, especially around certain... Uh, 
touchy subjects, like Native Americans or white people taking the piss out of black <coughs> culture. Anything that looks a bit like that, it, it's really serious. So we'll think about that seriousness in a little while. I'm going to get back to that seriousness at the end. But at the minute we have playfulness, so we have the playfulness of, of, of Rush Hour and we have the playfulness of, of the promotional materials around the Kung Fu, Fan, Kung Fu Panda franchise. So this song and then, then there's the vamps doing their thing, um, for better or for worse. Right, right, right. Okay, we, 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 could, we could dig deeper into that. But now, interest, an interesting thing that, that occurs to me, I, I quite like um, looking at all these different <coughs> things over and over again because then different questions start to emerge. Like, so when we watch this um, CeeLo Green and, and Jack Black video, and then we compare it to this one, and we go, well, which one's more Orientalist? Which one's worse? Which one would you rather be in? I'd go with the vamps. I'd rather be in a CGI one that isn't full of, like, Kung Fu, Chinaman stereotypes. This one, I'm thinking... I, I struggle with this one slightly, the, the, this, this CeeLo Green one, because it's so, it's so organised by Orientalist imagery. This one's organised more by the, the kind of CGI cartoon animation imagery of, of the Kung Fu Panda things themselves. So this one's more like the, the cartoon, so it seems a little bit more innocent. But then we can f send this back the other way and go, hang on a minute. When we notice the humans in the non-animated bit of this video, and we notice how Orientalist it is, potentially racist, certainly culturally, like, ridiculous, the whole thing is... Can we then look at Kung Fu Panda itself and go, oh, but it was just a bit of fun, wasn't it? It was just cuddly, greedy pandas and, and cute animals and, and then scary animals. And, and it's cuddly, so therefore it somehow means that it's innocent. But might it recast it slightly so that we can, thanks to the hideousness of the CeeLo Green Jack Black video, we can actually think about how awful, potentially awful, the, the Kung Fu Panda video is? Maybe? We can judge it harshly, but is it about judging it harshly? Yes, ultimately it is. Um, we also have it outside of the, the, the movie, co so we've moved from the realm of pop music into the realms of movies, as my children say. It's films. It's films, not movies. <laughs> You're British, not American. <laughs> movies, but you know, movies, they can... Anyway, they don't watch movies, they watch YouTube. Right, so... Moved from pop music, we've moved into film, movies, back into pop music, and now we also, it also exists in, uh, uh, in gaming, and, uh, and on Wii's, and on Nintendo's, and... I, I bet you some of you in this room have played this, and danced to this. I bet you, you, you're doing it now, you know it. <laughs> I mean, I would. I would if I had this particular one. But let's look at it.
Right, you get the picture. You have, haven't you? Who has? Come on. Who, who's danced to that? <laughs> Good. And it's actually, when I, when I found this the other day, when I was looking for um, clips to show you, I, the, 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 all the dance moves I have, like, my daughter does them? Where did, and she must, she's, I've never heard her playing that song, but this whole, that whole thing, that's the way, that's the way they move. Anyway, um, oh, there was a sociologist um, called Marcel Mauss, Marcel Mauss, right, um, who, who noticed that, so this was in the 19-somethingsies, right, ages ago, and, and he noticed that after the release of a Hollywood film in France, in Paris, all the teenagers that he, noticed, that he saw around the place were walking differently. And he, it, it, was like a, it was like one of those, it was like that Eureka moment, or that apple drop moment for Isaac Newton. It was like, shit, look at the influence that media has on people. So you've got, you've got Parisian teenagers walking a certain way one day, and then they go and see a, a cowboy film or something. <laughs> what, I don't know what it would be. I, look more, I can look into that, but so can you. Um, and, and the next day they're all walking a different way. Like John Wayne. Um, or whoever. Whomever. So, media, influence on the body, influence on our movements, on our, on our behaviours. And you can see this. In lots of ways, from, from the funny to the, to the left. Then we've got one for kids, I mean, uh, for, for really young kids, um, who might not be quite as um, adept as their older brothers and sisters. So, that, so that's a, like sim, simpler dance moves, and also it's more smiley. <laughs> uh, and I mean, but you think about what what kind of work are these kinds of texts doing? On the one hand, they're keeping the song alive, right? They're, they're, it's a nice song. It's it's this because disco moved on from being this radical, edgy, sexual, ethnic kind of like multicultural thing to being bland. It, like, disco became mainstream music pretty quick. Um, so that means that Kung Fu Fighting, the, the, the song, the original, beca- becomes quite easy listening. It's easy listening quite quickly. Um, and so because it remains, because disco remains a very, very listener-friendly, Radio 2-friendly, bland sort of music... Uh, and it's smiley and happy. You know, that's what disco is all about, isn't it? Being, yay, it's like we're dancing. It's men are dancing too. Everyone's dancing. Um, these smiles and these movements are teaching us different things. They're, you know, teach us how to dance, literally. But they're also reiterating certain sets of imagery about Kung Fu culture, which is being explicitly and, con- and, uh, and closely connected with China, right? So it's a little, these are like little packages restatements of what we might call potentially orientalist beliefs, little fragments, little groups of stereotypes about another culture or a specific form of culture. So, you know, keywords would be it's remediated, the song is being remediated, it's being used in different contexts. Um, it's also being reiterated or certain, certain ideas, images... Aesthetics, associations are being reiterated in these texts. And that means that certain sets of ideas are kind of being reproduced, are being restated. Um, One of the ways that Michel Foucault kind of explained what he meant by discourse was he talked about the regularity in dispersion of statements so that's like the more times and places and the more context in which you are told something is true, 
the more likely it is to feel like it is true. If everyone's saying the same thing in different ways, in different contexts, it's, it's true, we know it. So if everyone is associating, if we're being constantly shown these stereotypical images, China, Chinese, Kung Fu, Orientalism, all the cliches, it remains an active part of our culture, an active set of beliefs and associations. Roland Barthes called it connotation. Connotation. So any one of these images doesn't necessarily mean anything. You could be wearing like a yellow costume. You could have a straight white beard. And it doesn't, it just denotes, oh, got a beard, got a yellow costume on. But what does it connote culturally? It connotes this kind of stereotypical Chinese sage or something like that, right? And then we're one step away from going, well, is this racism? You know, is this, is this a scary bad thing? Um, let's have a look at, what time is it? We'll do one or two more. We'll do, these, we'll do this quickly. I'll do a little bit of this one. This is another use of the song. The quality's bad, but, um, and so is the song, but, um... But Carl Douglas is in it. That's enough of that. Um, there's, there, we could say a little bit about that. The fact that Carl Douglas is in it is quite interesting, but I think there's much more to say about this. So I'll have a quick look at this one. Since there were 12 surgical residents at Sacred Heart fighting for four attendees, Kirk was asking for the team of staff. Oh, damn. Another piece of stairs. Kirk thought he was the only one who heard that. There's, there's a very great deal that you could say about that clip. Um, if you were to look at that clip um, in terms of what intertextual references it's making, it's all, it, refers, it all refers back to the, to the film culture of the 1970s, all refers back to Bruce Lee films. The whole thing is a replaying of, of Bruce Lee films. But it's also, it also kind of pokes fun at that. Right? It makes it all seem a bit funny. It's a bit like, it's a bit, I mean, the way that everybody was kung fu fighting seems to as well. Like, we hear the song, you probably never will again hear it and go, yay! You'll probably go, 
God, that lecture. Do you remember that lecture? Um, but, but the song tends to go, you kind of hear it go, yay, it's this stupid song. You all laugh, right? And so we see the, the, the references, the amusing kind of comedic references to these once serious films, Bruce Lee films in particular. And a certain impulse in academic scholarship, certainly in North America, has been to judge this kind of thing really harshly and go, look at the way that that, that television programme, probably produced by white guys, ridicules Asian culture and ridicules the black connection with that culture. And I think that that impulse is wrong because I think that it's more like a shared kind of delight in it, a delight in this kind of movement, a delight in these kind of cultural references. But we'll get back to that later. Um, what I think we'll do now is this would be this is a quite inappropriate point to sort of stop and have our little break. We've put all these questions on the table. We're going to look at a case study or two. We're going to look at two case studies, which suggest that this song, like, is racist, just is racist. And then I'm going to complicate that a little bit. So we'll have we'll have we can have ten minutes today because I'm ahead of schedule. For ten minutes. Uh, all right then. Um, so I would like us to look at two two examples, two different two case studies, two different iterations um, of this song. The first one was the uh, former comedian, now character in an advert, Marcus Brigstock. Uh, doing that Let's Dance for Comic Relief stuff. One of the, one of the first um, times that Comic Relief did that. So this is Marcus Brigstock on Let's Dance for Comic Relief. Okay, you get, you get the picture, right? You get the picture. The next um, example I want to look at, the next case study, is this. Um, which was a story widely reported in the Daily Mail, in particular the Daily Mail. Pub singer arrested for racism after Chinese passers-by hear him perform kung fu fighting. Right? Later that night he was phoned at a Chinese restaurant and then arrested. A pub singer has been arrested on suspicion of racism for singing the classic chart hit Kung Fu Fighting. The song, performed by Simon Ledger, 34, was said to have offended two Chinese people as they walked past the bar where he was singing. The entertainer regularly performs the 1974 number one hit, originally by disco star Carl Douglas, at the Driftwood Beach Bar in Sandown on the Isle of Wight. But after one of the passers-by reported his routine on Sunday afternoon, Mr. Ledger was arrested on suspicion of racially aggravated harassment. We were performing Kung Fu fighting as we do, all, as we do during all our sets, he said. People of all races were loving it. 
Chinese people have never been offended by it before. But this lad walking past with his mum started swearing at us and making obscene hand gestures before taking a picture on his mobile phone. We hadn't even seen them when he started the song. He must have phoned the police. Officers later called Mr Ledger while he was eating in a Chinese restaurant to arrange a meeting. The singer assumed it was a prank, but he was later arrested and is still under investigation. They seemed pretty amazed, but said the law is the law and it was their duty, he is reported to have said. It's political correctness gone potty. There are plenty of Welsh people at our shows. Doesn't, does it mean I can't play any Tom Jones? Right? So, um, now, two examples. First one by Marcus Brigstock, performing in kind of oriental drag. Um, based on one joke, I guess the joke is, isn't it funny to be dressed up like a funky China man and doing Kung Fu? Um, and the second one is the story of someone allegedly just playing the song anyway as part of a set and some people take offence um, and he is accused of racially aggravated harassment. Now, these are two different examples um, in two different contexts, uh, using the same song. So what are we to make of them? Like, no one actually, as far as I know, has accused Marcus Brigstock of a kind of racism or something. All I know is that when I saw that, I was watching Let's Dance for Comic Relief that night, and it made me feel, like, viscerally disgusted. Like, I was, I was offended on behalf of all Chinese people, right? Which I have no right to be or to do. But I thought, this is just racism. It's just racism. It's like one year I went to an amateur pantomime. Like, it wasn't a professional pantomime. It was an amateur pantomime. And it was uh, Aladdin. And a lot of Aladdin is set in China. Which I, I had forgotten that. Aladdin is all set in China. They all go to China. Um, and it was based on one joke all the way through. The joke was, um, don't Chinese people speak English with funny accents? That was the joke, right? And I was sitting there like, I can't, I can't believe. So I actually, I turned into that man, and I was straight back home emailing them. This is just racism. And, I, and, I, and, I, and they wrote back to me and said, it's not racism, it's, it's comedy, and I was like, it's, it's a big, steaming pile of shit, right? Um, and my question was, would all those actors who went out there on the stage doing this joke that lasted the entire play, the entire performance, uh, taking the mickey out of, of Chinese names, etc., would they have been as happy and as convinced it wasn't racist if they went out on the stage and they saw, like, two coach loads of Chinese tourists in the audience? I think they wouldn't. I think they would have gone, oh, shit. I wish we'd thought about this. Right? There's something problem problematic. Let's go problematic with the... Uh, with this parodic performance, this ironic, joking performance of another culture... So that's even the, oh, it's just a bit of a laugh line. That's the just, it was just a joke, it was just a bit of fun response. And now I think you're on dodgy ground there. Anyway, then we have the case of um, the performer who claims he's just performing a song that he always play, uh, plays, and it's just a, it was just a 1970s hit, and everyone knows it and everyone loves it. And people in the audience apparently get in offended and saying he wasn't just playing the song. Oh, I, I did look into this. There are other stories. There was a lot more. A lot more people were interviewed. And they, this story ran for a little while. Um, and the Chinese people apparently said he was doing something else. And when they came into the bar or into the location, he started playing the song at them. Right? So, like, you're playing a song at somebody... That's what they said. He's playing this song, like, aggressively at us. And you think, well, it, can such a thing take place? Like, and the answer is yes. It can, 
you know, it, you know, if anyone's ever experienced foot chants on football pitches or, or lovely people in playgrounds singing songs at other people, you know, if you've got a group of lads singing Isn't She Lovely at, at a girl, that's probably not nice. It's probably not an actual, it's not being used as a love song in that way. So, oh, and the other good thing, and this is a really interesting thing that I wanted to, to mention. They actually pulled, they actually wheeled out Carl Douglas for interviews and asked him about the song. And he said, the song isn't racist. It's a meeting of two different cultures, East and West. Right? It's a melding of two different cultures, East and West. Um, and that's, I think this is, really, this is really important and really salient and really problematic because the song musically is organised by what they call the Oriental Riff, right? There have been other terms for it, but musically, the song is organised at the start by this, or a version of this. Yeah? Or here's a slightly different iteration of the same. Yeah? And it appears in lots of different versions across lots of different pop songs. Lots of people have used it. The Vapors have used it. Kirsten Dunst has used it. David Bowie's used it. All sorts of people have used it. So. What are you going to do on the top of the box? On the Vapors, just outside the top of the with a single turning Japanese. <laughs> I'll get back to that in a minute. So, the Oriental Riff. It's used in songs like this to signify, to connote the Orient. And Western listeners associate, it's apparently what it is. The notes used in the riff, this is just ripped from Wikipedia, by the way. So if I was actually writing this in an essay, I would put quotation marks around it and give it a Harvard-style citation. But because it's just a lecture, I'm passing this off as my own knowledge of musical uh, terminology. The notes used in the riff are part of a pentatonic scale and often harmonised with parallel open force, which makes the riff sound like East Asian music to a typical Western listener. So apparently the pentatonic scale is a musical scale that when Western listeners hear it, they think it sounds Oriental or Asian. So... The history of the Oriental Riff is quite interesting because it's got nothing whatsoever to do with China and it was invented in 1847 for a performance of Aladdin uh, in Paris and it's been used ever since to signify either on a stage the appearance of some Chinese people, Chinese characters, or that we're now in a Chinese location. So it started off as a convenient um, sonic device to signal, like, here we are, this is where we are now. The same way you might signal whether you were in a kind of a Western frontier bar or you might, you're in a jazz club or you're, you know, you would signal it that way. Um, so it's been used as a dramatic device, but it has really no connection with um, Asia itself in any way. So, if we think about Carl Douglas saying, oh, the Kung Fu fighting is a, is a fusion of two cultures, East and West. It's actually not, is it? It's, it? What it is, is it's a conversation, musically and lyrically, within, entirely within Western culture, about a Western notion of another culture. Um... And I think that that's, you find this more often than not in culture. You think you're dealing with something else. You think you might be dealing with issues to do with China, for example. And really you have, you've got, there's literally no connection to China in this song, not musically. The guy singing it isn't, isn't Chinese. He's singing about some people that he thinks might have been Chinese. But it's really a kind of internal Western conversation about the Orient. 
about something else. And I think then if you look at, for example, well, let's have a little look at the Vapor song now. So, the va so you've had, we've had um, great, massive international success on the part of Carl Douglas and his mid-70s song. The Vapors come along in 1980 and think, well, we'll have a bit of that then. So they use the same riff in a different way to write a song, not about China, but now about Japan. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a thought on the papers, just outside the top of the day with their singles, Turning Japanese. So, right, I, there's, the lyrics go on, the song goes on, um, and it's a, a really controversial song in, a, in, a, in, a, in lots of ways because the lyrics are odd at best, like really awful at worst. The meaning of the lyrics is really deeply offensive at worst. But the argument, so... On the one hand, I think I'm turning Japanese. I think I'm going mad. I think, uh, I think I'm going insane. I think I'm becoming something that I wasn't before. I won't go through all the possible permutations of the lyrics, right? Because um, all of the permutations of the lyrics are awful. But when you look at the, the band's defense of it, they just said, no, it's just, it just sort of rhymed and it sort of scanned and it kind of meant different kind of meant something else. But, and you go, okay. And they actually said at one point, it could have been I'm turning Lebanese. But I think that it, that wouldn't have worked if they've already settled on the ding, 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 ding. I think I'm turning Lebanese. I think it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So my argument, well, not my argument. I think the sense is that there's something cultural going on in this song. There's also something cultural going on in the... Um, in Kung Fu Fighting. So the songs might be innocent, like the authors, the creators, the inventors of the song, the people who write them and who sing them, they have no hostile negative intentions. We don't know their intention. We don't know their authorial intention as authors of the song, right? But culturally, it's aligned with some problematic impulses. Now, they didn't make a video for this song. I don't know if those images of those those Japanese images were intercut later into this, or whether they showed them at the time of the performance on top of the pops. However, there is, if you look on YouTube, official videos galore for this song. Right now, the Vapors didn't make a video for this song, so any official video or any video for it has been made by a fan, essentially. So they're fan produced interpretations of what they think a good video of the song would be. So let's have a little look at this official video for Turning Japanese. <laughs>
So, so you get the picture. There's, so, so the, the, the fan makers of the, of the video for I'm turn, I'll Turn Japanese, they collect together a lot of clips that they think really go well and nicely with this song. Uh, and the first clip is a clip of uh, Japanese bombing raids during the Second World War, kamikaze pilots. We have clips from Jackie Chan films, which are Hong Kong films, Chinese films. We have clips that are clearly from Vietnam. We have clips from China. We have clips from North Korea. And it's all just jumbled in. And you can watch that and go, this is a great video for turning in Japanese. It's totally appropriate. Or you can go, what does it mean that this collect... What, what does this collection of images mean that someone's gone, right, I need to do... I really... I feel the need... <laughs> I feel the need to spend my time editing together a new video for Turning Japanese, this 1980 pop hit, right? <laughs> I remember when YouTube sort of started, and you'd look at it and go, but, but why? But why have you done that? Why did you spend your time doing that? Anyway, so someone's done that. And you can regard that vid... I would regard this video as a symptom not just of someone's, <coughs> not just of the maker's own idiosyncratic take on the possible meanings of turning Japanese, but as an expression of the way that certain sorts of images, certain sets of imagery, kind of permeate our thinking, like you just absorb them and go something about Asia, Japan, kamikaze, samurai, geishas, Vietnam, China. You know, just it's like that kind of lazy cultural ignorance, like there's a studied kind of ignorance to all of this. And I think that you can look at that and um, see the way that cultural, like what Foucault would call discourses, permeate our, the ways that we make sense of things, the way that we kind of organise our thinking. This kind of general mush of imagery... Um, tells us something about the way culture works and the way ignorance works and the way cultural associations work. So we don't just have to... I mean, you could, you, could, you could destroy this. You could judge it harshly. You can judge this song harshly, right? I think the, the vapors turning Japanese, you can judge it quite harshly, lyrically. Um, it has no redeeming features. I'm not even going to broach the Kirsten Dunst. Oh, you want me to? Let's have a... We'll do a quick look at the Kirsten Dunst version of this, right? This is a complete <laughs> enigma to me. Okay, so, so have you, have you seen that one before? Right. So what do we make of that? I mean, you, I think that you can... So this is another silly video for a simple song, right? 
But you can look at it and go, what the hell is going on in this situation? And you, that, uh, making sense, interpreting a video like that, an occurrence like that, a product like that, ask, you, it really needs you to ask some quite difficult and deep questions about the cultural context in which that occurs. Like, so you've got white American woman orientalizing herself, self-orientalizing, performing something about Japanese culture, which is already often depicted as kind of like a strongly constructed performance, often of misogynistic kind of values. It's really, really, really complicated. But I think that as, if we're thinking about our essays here, which is one of the reasons I decided to do this sort of like sprawling case study to kind of suggest ways that you might look at text. We have to defer our moral judgment. We all have our moral judgments about texts. Like I have my moral judgment about this official video for the Vapor song and I have my moral judgments about, about you know, Kung Fu fighting itself. We put that on hold for a minute and we think, what has gone into this text? What, does, what can we get out of it? What does it tell us about what, what is going on? And a cross-cultural text like this is incredibly complex and, and poses all sorts of questions about, well, we'll get to them now, about cultural appropriation, about race, about orientalism or self-orientalization. And then you go, hang on a second, though. Does Japanese popular culture orientalize itself? And the answer to that is, of course, yes. Uh, because all cultures capitalize on what sells. What do Westerners want? What does the market want? You know, what, what does it want? But that's not just Oriental. It's like, what do, what do American tourists who go to Loch Ness want? <laughs> you know, when they, they go, to the, go to the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, what do they want? They want kilts, sporans and whiskey. That's what they want. So that's what we'll give them. Anyway. So with all of these things, if we go, oh, let's go back to t uh, Kung Fu fighting. Is it cultural appropriation? Um, so what do we see in Kung Fu fighting? We see that, yeah, all, all the, everyone involved in it is dressing up in, in sort of Kung Fu-ish, sort of Chinese-ish, possibly, clothes. Is dressing up or fancy dress, is that cultural appropriation? Is it a bad thing? Is it always a bad thing? And isn't all culture a kind of performance anyway? I mean, I feel really odd if when I go to, say, if I go to a martial arts club and you start to have to put on the, the supposedly indigenous uniform, it always feels a bit odd. This all feels a bit odd, but it's part and parcel of that, of that practice. So I'm orientalizing myself, giving it all of this, using Chinese and Japanese terms and so on. But, but is, that, is that cultural appropriation or, or is there something else going on in that? And then, you know, what determines whether something is acceptable or not? And anyway, is culture actually someone's property. You know, who says I can't dress up in any way that I want and behave any way that I want, speak any language that I want uh, and, and have any religion that I want? You know, who, who says culture is owned by someone? Is it someone's property or is it just a kind of repository of textual features? So, you know, Kirsten Dunst goes to Japan and goes to Tokyo and makes this wacky, fun, happy bouncy around kawaii video thing. Is that a crime? That kind of cultural cross-dressing? Um, I think we need to think about, there are certain types of things that are, I think are obviously forms of cultural appropriation that would be wrong. So certain cultures have like, you know, kind of like sacred forms of knowledge or forms of knowledge or forms of imagery that really only a select few people are allowed access to. But then you get kind of Western tourists who want to have them on a tea towel or a T-shirt 
And I think that, that you really, that's really kind of dodgy ground there when you start to mess with it now. Like even in, in this country now, even in this country, it's against the law to deface the, the, the image of the queen, of the monarch. In North America, you're not allowed to walk on the stars and stripes, the star-spangled banner. You're not allowed to. to you know, so, and if that, is, if that is done, that's why people burn each other's flags all the time. Because it's, it's, a, it's a real kind of cultural taboo, like you can't do this to our culture. But here's an example of something um, that is, that is a, I think, a really blatant and deliberate kind of example of a form of, a bizarre form of cultural appropriation. It's from the film The Beach. Has anyone seen The Beach? One person, not bad. It's a, it's, it's a film about um, Westerners mostly white Westerners trying to find paradise so they go off to Bangkok and Bangkok's not foreign enough for them so they hear about the legend of the beach and it's like an unspoiled paradise so they go there and spoil it. Um, but, it but someone's died, right? One of the crowd has died and this is the situation we have here. The funeral. Probably enough, actually. Um, so basically what we're dealing with here is what we've got in this situation is Mr. White Dreadlocks playing his guitar and singing Redemption Song, which is the Bob Marley uh, song, which is essentially about, what, about uh, his entire culture having been pulled into slavery. It's about being... It's, it's like from the first person of having been enslaved... So it's a very Afro-Caribbean kind of special song about a very, very unique and terrible situation. So on the one hand, you can look at it and go, because I mean, I like that song. I like Bob Marley. And I would sing that song. And I probably have sung that song. But like, the film sets that up as a, as a, as a sort of irony. Like, what the shit? Like, white dreadlocks singing... I mean, so then you can kind of go, this is ludicrous. And the term that we would be using now for that is cultural appropriation. I don't particularly like the term cultural appropriation, but it says something, because on the one hand, you can look at it, it's like, a, it's like one of those visual kind of paradoxes where you look at it on, and you go, it's fine, it's just a bloke singing redemption song. What's the problem? What's the big deal? Can't we all just sing anything? If we like it, we can sing it. Yes. But on the other hand, it's Mr. White Dreadlocks, Imagine him, imagining himself to be the descendant of people who were pulled into slavery. So we are in a problematic situation. I mean, my personal response would be like to say, stop being a knob. You know, just, you, you're, not, you're not the descendant of black uh, enslaved Africans. What, who do you think you are? But I wouldn't, I would joke, he would be my friend, and I would joke, say, come on, mate, white dreadlocks. And that would be the nature of our friendship. But I had dreadlocks once, by the way. <laughs> however, however, in my defence, in my own defence, they were part of a Mohican and they were flamingo pink. And I bloody loved them. And so did my mum, right? And, and before graduation... So university, getting ready for graduation, all, everybody went, oh shit, and they all dyed their hair brown again and, and, and kind of cut their dreadlocks off and all the rest of it. I had my hair done especially for the day, flamingo pink, um, and it was fab. I don't think I was appropriating any culture at that point. Maybe pretending to be a rebel when actually I'm turning up by graduation to be the most institutionalised... 
<laughs> bearer of a two-one degree. Anyway, so we're all so cultural appropriation is a problematic term. Racism then is kung fu fighting racist? Is it inherently racist? Is it ever racist? Is it inescapably racist? Is it never, ever, never, never, never racist? Or is it potentially racist? And if so, where is, where is the racism? Uh, does the racism take place in the lyrics? Now we can see that we, if, we, if, we have, if we're confronted with a text that is explicitly racist, like a song, like a chant, some kind of racist anthem, then we go, yeah, that's a racist song. And it's never going to not be, I think. I think it would be really hard. You could put it in a different context where it becomes a joke somehow, but... Or you could think about, there are films in which there are characters who are explicitly racist, but the film itself, you can't say the film itself is racist. I'm thinking of American History X here, but it shows my age. But the lyrics, the visuals, are the visuals racist? Is there a racism to the visual imagery around the song? Is the music racist? Or is it something to do with the context? So here, are, just quickly, we'll have a little look and we'll try and get to the bottom of this song, right? Everybody was kung fu fighting. Those kids, or indeed cats, so there's no agreement about what the lyrics actually are for this song. I've, I've seen dozens of different versions of the lyrics. Those kids were fast as lightning. In fact, it was a little bit frightening, but they fought with expert timing. They were funky China men from funky Chinatown. They were chopping them up. They were chopping them down. It's an ancient Chinese art, and everybody knew their part. From a fainting to a slip and a kicking from the hip, everybody was kung fu fighting, uh, 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 timing. There was Funky Billy Chin and little Sammy Chong. He said, here comes the big boss, let's get it on. We took the bow and made a stand, started swaying with the hand. A sudden motion made me skip. Now we're into a brand new trip. Everybody was going to... Da, 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 da. So, this, these are the lyrics that I pondered for at least 24 hours. And eventually, after all the possible, like, is it everybody in the world who's Kung Fu fighting? No, not. But, but that's part of the appeal of it, because in the 70s, everybody was into it. They make programs now called Everybody Was Kung Fu Fighting, the Kung Fu craze of the 70s. You know, there's documentaries galore. Everybody was Kung Fu Fighting in 1973, 74, but nobody really knew how to do it. Everyone, was, everyone wanted to be Kung Fu Fighting. Fast as lightning, they were. So was Bruce Lee. So it's fast, frightening, expert timing. That's Kung Fu. So there was some funky... So is he watching a demonstration? Is he talking about watching a film? Probably not. No. Because he's, he's with at least some men from Chinatown. We've got Billy Chin and Sammy Chong, who presumably... So they might be in Chinatown. There's at least some people from Chinatown, right? And if you follow all the options down, I think the only thing is he's coming back from his first ever Kung Fu class and he's telling everybody about it. We went to this class, everybody was kung fu fighting, fast as lightning, da -da -da -da. and then here comes the big boss, so we had to get back to it because we were chatting. And the and the potential racist terms, China men, as opposed to Chinese men. Possibly racist, yeah, it's got racist overtones, right? If we remember the big Lebowski. <laughs> Dude, the preferred nomenclature is Asian American, right? Not China man. Who's seen The Big Lebowski? I want you all to make me a solemn pledge that you will watch The Big Lebowski as soon as is humanly possible. Who's with me? Who's with me? Who's with me? One, two, watch The Big Lebowski. If you don't watch The Big Lebowski, I think I failed you as a, as a, as a lecturer. Sorry, I need to, I need to crack on. <laughs> I don't think these lyrics are racist. I don't think there's anything racist in the lyrics, basically. Right? I think that perhaps there's something orientalist in the visuals and in the music. But I think that ultimately we're going to have to say that context is everything. I think that it's Orientalist, through and through. But Orientalism isn't necessarily negative. It's just a thing. 
For Edward Said, when he's writing about Orientalism, the very specific history of Orientalism in the West, um, it is a problem. He's, he's regarding it as a Western problem. But actually, I think that when you look at the... So the visuals here, yes, I think this is quite Orientalist, but I think this is anyone who dresses up and gets into kind of martial arts culture. If you Google, this was a Google search for visuals for martial artists. There's a lot of cultural cross-dressing here, a lot of fantasizing about, about our own identity. And if we Google Orientalism, visual, like just a, a, an image search, this is the classic stuff that Said is talking about. And it is heavily connected to, to, to political issues that exist today. If you Google Chinese Kung Fu, you see that actually the Chinese martial arts industry, the Chinese cultural industry, is, is all over this. They're trying to capitalise on it. This is what you call self-orientalising as well. Orientalism isn't necessarily a bad thing. Orientalism can be that thing that gets you into a foreign cultural practice, can be that thing that, that fuels or oils or sparks a kind of cross-cultural encounter. Um, so, this is where we are. So, the, the approach that I've been using and the approach that I would like to encourage you to use is, is, is kind of like this. Based really in the work of, say, Roland Barthes, Jacques Derrida, who I'll say a little bit more about next week. Possibly also a figure like um, Jacques Rancière, Stuart Hall, Julia Kristeva. So, what have I done today? I have looked at the text as a text and not in terms of it being the invention of an author with an intention, right? And you all not pinning it to that intention. So because a text functions in different contexts, can be redeployed in different ways. So here's a little bit about what Roland Barthes means about the death of the author. In the essay, What is an Author?, Michel Foucault drew attention to the fact that the notion of the author is so socially constructed. Historically, there are texts with no authors. They're just written by people. The Bible was written by God, remember? Bible, word of God, a lot of people scripted it out. A lot of people did different versions of the Bible and so on. No authorial attribution. Foucault says the invention of the character of the author is a new thing, a few hundred years old. It's a social construct that we now associate with things like genius and creativity and individuality and so on. Foucault claimed that the literary author was invented during the 18th century and isolated ownership of the text as one of the characteristics of the relationship between the text and the author. So we look at the text and go, well, what did the author mean? What could the author have meant? And you go, the text means this because the author must have meant this. Right? But Foucault says that's a way of pinning it down. You pin down the meaning to that sense. Foucault urged us to imagine a culture where discourse would circulate without any need for an author, a world where it did not matter who was speaking. Roland Barthes went one step further and declared the death of the author. Barthes argued that once published, the text is no longer under the control of the author and the author is irrelevant. Instead, Barthes asser asser asserted that the text is merely a product of other texts and can only be interpreted through those other texts. Individual authorship of works is to be replaced by inter... What are you doing? Don't do that. It's not what we want. This could be really bad for us, you know. Um, no, that's just... You're not going to make me do this, are you? You are. Sorry about this. Um, that's the, one of the downsides of Prezi, is this. Um, so, intertextuality. So what do we mean by intertextuality? The idea is not that an author invents a text and that's the only thing it can possibly mean. It's more like an author assembles fragments of information together, themes, ideas, images, genres, styles, um, other textual material and constructs a new text. So that means you can look at any text, right? and explode it in a sense. You can find out, boom, what ingredients went into it. Julia Kristeva calls this intertextuality. We look for the, the, look for the way textual material... They use the idea of text because it's like a textile. 
You might like the one piece of thread that runs through a pattern. You can unpick that and go, that thread appears here, that thread appears there. Okay, intertextuality. Jacques Derrida, who's one of the same gang, Roland Barthes, Julia Kristeva, Jacques Derrida, most infamously argued there is nothing outside of the text. There's nothing outside the text. And people went, God, this guy's insane. He doesn't believe in reality. He thinks there's only books and only words and only texts. But what Derrida meant by text was everything, when we look at it and start to make sense of it, is a bit like the way we look at a book or words on a page and try to make sense of them. We're kind of just piecing together fragments of information, fragments of information that all should have quotation marks around them. Every word that we use, we're, in a sense, quoting someone else. Every text that we construct is in some way a quotation of another text, right? Um, so Stuart Hall would argue that you, would, you need to look at the discursive conjuncture or the context before you decide what something is. So if we've, if we've looked a little bit at some iterations of everybody, of Kung Fu fighting, right, and a few other things, each one of those iterations in a time and a place in a cultural context made it into something very different. It's the same text, same sounds, same words often, right? Different thing, it has different effect, it has a different meaning. In the first iteration, it was like, yay, this is fun, we love this new stuff, we're excited by disco, we're excited by kung fu, because we've seen the programmes and seen the new films. And then it keeps coming back to play upon that popularity, to sell again kung fu panda, and to sell different, different things. It's also intertextually used in different songs like Turn in Japanese by the Vapors and by the different iterations of that. It becomes something different. It is possible for me or you or anyone to use that song in a racist manner easily, right? But we could use it in a foolish manner, you know, we could get into it and be naively orientalist. We can use it cynically, ironically. We could sing it at someone. We st if every time our Chinese peers came in the room, we started singing everybody was Kung Fu fighting at them. Hmm. Then you're probably getting into the realms of racism and abuse, and it's kind of an aggravated sort of a racial assault, in a sense. But the other really interesting thing, and I'll finish off on this, is, and I got this quotation from this book called The Ignorant Schoolmaster by um, Jacques Rancière, and um, it's just a line, everything is in everything. So in a sense, you, could, you can look at something as trivial as a pop song, right? And especially if we, if we think about that Kirsten Dunst video, which I didn't actually want to talk about. One of the reasons I didn't want to talk about it is because it's too complicated. What the bloody hell is going on in that? We, it, 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 analyzing that and making sense of that, we need to make some sense of what we think Japanese culture is all about, popular culture, gendered culture, cultural cross-dressing. You know, it asks us to make sense of that text. We also have to make sense of an enormous amount of context. So everything is in everything. Um, which is one of the reasons I really like looking at supposedly trivial text, which is where I began, which is where I'll stop. Okay? Thank you. We'll leave it at that.